Well, welcome to another Friday night. I want to go a little bit further in our Healing from Complex Trauma and Understanding Trauma series and talk about the polyvagal theory. Now, about the last five to ten years, this has become a very popular theory. And so there's just tons of information available on the internet if you want to learn more about it. But what I have found, though, is in working with clients on a daily basis is that for many people coming into recovery, it's still a very new concept. They're not familiar with it. And so I thought I would do um, a talk about it and just give you an overview in understanding this very important bit of research that has come out through the work of Dr. Stephen Porges. He began in 1994 in the Brain Body Center at the University of Illinois. Um, and he's done massive amounts of research that have been joined by others and has written a book called The Polyvagal Theory. And it has become really a new way of understanding at a deeper level how our central nervous system operates. And I've talked in the past about our central nervous system and how tra trauma affects it. And so today we're going to review a little bit of that, but go deeper into understanding the vagus nerve and really the three states of vagal states, they call them. Um, and I hope it will be helpful if this is already familiar to you. Um, my apologies, but uh, for those that this is new, I hope it will be very helpful. So let's begin with just understanding the vagus nerve. So what they have found is the vagus nerve is the biggest nerve in the body. And you can see in the diagram that it basically goes from the brain stem right through to all of the organs of the body. And it goes right kind of down the spinal column and then branches out into touching each of the organs of the body. The word vagus comes from the Latin word, which means wandering. And so it's just this nerve that wanders from the brain stem down to all of the different parts of the body and communicates with them. And what they found is that only mammals have the vagus nerve. It's not in reptiles, it's only in mammals. The next thing that's important to understand is that there's two sides to that to the vagus nerve. There's the front or the ventral vagus nerve and there's the back or the dorsal. The ventral is, the front part is the newer part and it is myelinated. So it's covered with this sheath and so it makes it a faster part of the nerve and it's newer and so it's developed later in kind of human ev evolution terms and it's known as the social engagement system. And it's the part that's above the diaphragm. The dorsal or the back part is the older part. It's not myelinated, it's older um, and slower, and it's below the diaphragm. So those are the front and back, the two parts of this vagus nerve. I think one of the best ways to understand the vagus nerve is to see it as basically this super information highway. And it receives tons of information on this highway, but it also sends out tons of information. Just from the five senses, the vagus nerve is receiving 11 million bits of information a second. And I show you a graph there that shows how much is coming from the eyes, from touch, from ears, smell, and taste. So it's a super highway. It is just processing information beyond what we can really even comprehend. The vagus nerve, and I'm putting this in, in really kind of layman's terms, but it has three main roles. The first one is to sense danger. And so that is stress obvious danger to my physical health um, and sickness. So it, it's sensing danger. Secondly, based on what it's sensing, it then turns on three systems. 
one of three systems. And, and that's a big part of its job. And then if it turns on the systems that are designed to protect, so fight flight or the freeze, the next part of the job is to how to get you back to the healthy system. And so it's like a horse that has been spooked and it is gone into fight flight. It is running away crazy. The vagus nerve is like the reins on a horse where you pull it back down to calm it and soothe it and get it to regulate itself again. So those are the three main functions of the vagus nerve. So let me give you three ways that we perceive danger and the vagus nerve is involved in these. So the first is what we all are familiar with called perception. And so it's the using our five senses to perceive what is going on in our environment around us. And then we have interoception and that's the built-in system that determines what's going on inside of us, in our body. So it's collecting inf information from our heart, from our breathing, from our hunger, that our bladder, our bowels, all of it, it's picking up all of these internal sig signals to, t to tell how my body is doing. And so if it's feeling lack of oxygen, then it picks up on that and increases my breathing, increases my heartbeat. All of that is interoception. So you can see that's a huge system. But then there's the third, and this is a key one with the vagus nerve, and that's what we call neuroception. So perception, it is perceiving with the five senses. Neuroception is sensing beyond the five senses, whether there's danger or not, whether there's this is safe or life-threatening or dangerous. So perception is based on the five senses and cognitive thought. Neuroception works beyond conscious awareness, and that's the key piece to understand. It's the sixth sense. It's our gut. It's what picks up stuff that our five senses don't pick up. So let me give you an example. I work with many people that grew up in homes where there is no violence, no abuse, but yet something wasn't safe. They sensed it as a child. What was that? Well, maybe there was just this undercurrent of anger between mom and dad that they never saw them fight in front of the kids. They always did it in their bedroom at night. But the child sensed that's neuroception. And so it's so important to understand neuroception when it comes to complex trauma. Because for a lot of people with complex trauma, they go, I didn't have any big trauma. I didn't have any abuse. No, but your neuroception was picking up something is not safe here. I can't connect. There's anger, there's depression, there's whatever it might be that's causing me to feel this is not safe. And so that becomes such an important part of understanding the vagus nerve is this neuroception piece. So the front part, the ventral side, is focusing on safety cues. That's what it's picking up. The dorsal side, it's focusing on how to respond to those cues. So if it's picking up safety, then the dorsal side says, okay, we're gonna go to this system. If it's picking up danger, then it says we're gonna go to the, one of these two systems. And so that's how it's working together. So that leads us to the three states of the nervous system, so the three polyvagal states. So we've talked in the past and did a talk on our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system as being the two parts of our nervous system. So our sympathetic nervous system is our energy part for work, for productivity, for safety, for survival. All of that is the 
go, go, go. Then you have the balancing part, which is the parasympathetic, which is for rest, for rejuvenation, for healing and restoring the body and all the systems. And so those are designed to work in balance, that you work hard, then you rest, and then your body can heal, and then you can repeat the next day. So those polyvagal now takes that and, and expands on it, which to me is gives you even more help. help. So Deb Dana, who's done a lot of research along with Steve Porges on this whole theory, has come up with it, what is known as the polyvagal ladder. The first state is what is known as the ventrovagal state, the social engagement state. It's also known as the tend and befriend state. So this is the ideal state. This is where we should be all the time. This is the state that only happens when I'm feeling safe. And so the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are working in balance. The one knows when to work, to produce, and then to rest and self-care. And so that's happening in the social engagement state. Key points to understand is it's only when I'm in the social engagement state, when I'm feeling safe, that I am able to connect with others and that I tr feel true happiness at a deep level. Another way to say it is it's when I'm in my social engagement state, it's when I'm fully human. Our brains work at our maximum. We experience all the emotions. I don't need to shut anything down. I can be fully authentic and vulnerable and open because it's safe and I can connect. So in the social engagement state, that's where I'm truly human. This is a state also where only where our body can heal itself and, and take care of itself. So again, the ideal state. But if you look at the latter, the question becomes, what happens if my neuroception, perception, interception pick up danger? Well, then it goes to the sympathetic state. Neuroception, perception, interoception, they can pick up stress, pain, or danger. And this pain can come from injury or sickness. So it's important to understand if it picks up danger, stress, or pain, what it then does is it goes 100% to the sympathetic nervous system or 100% to the parasympathetic nervous system. One of the two systems takes over. So the first option is to go to the sympathetic state where the sympathetic system takes over. So that is your fight or flight. And so your body is releases cortisol and adrenaline, which gives you extra blood, extra sugar to your muscles and to your extremities so that you can fight and flight. Your heart and blood pressure increase, your breathing increases, your salivation, your digestion, your immune system all decrease because you're in survival mode. You don't need to be digesting food right now. You need to be surviving. So that's the sympathetic state. What is important to understand with that is in this state, I'm actually less human. I become more reptilian, more like a reptile because now it's just survival, fight or flight. Let me just add a piece to this in the context of complex trauma. One of the complex trauma responses is fawning and fawning doesn't look like fight or flight. It looks like the person is very people-pleasing, very warm, very accommodating, very engaged, and you go, how is that fight or flight? But fawn response is coming out of when the sympathetic state is activated. And a person is looking like they're socially engaged when actually they're highly attuned to everybody else's nervous system. And if they see anybody else's nervous system engaged, then they go to 
even more extreme ways of people pleasing, whatever, to try to regulate everybody else's nervous system so that they can stay safe. So it, it's a form, a subtle form of going into that sympathetic state. But let's say the sympathetic state doesn't work. Fight or flight doesn't get you to safety. So then you go down the ladder to the dorsal state and the parasympathetic takes over. And that's where you go to freeze. And basically the parasympathetic, when it takes over, says, okay, now we are going to prepare the body to get hurt and to not feel pain. So we are going to release opioids in the body so you don't feel pain. Then we're going to bring all of the blood from the extremities inward. We're going to decrease heart rate, not increase it, decrease blood pressure, decrease breathing, so that if you do get cut and bleed, it's not gonna be as bad. And so everything goes to freeze, to sh shut down. And then it can even go further, and that's let's disconnect, dissociate. So we can't fix the external world, let's retreat into an internal world where we can be safe. And so the person dissociates. So that is when the parasympathetic takes over and, and depression can also play a role in this and helping shut everything down. So once again, you can see that the person has become less human and has gone into this reptilian state. So that's an overview of the polyvagal theory, the vagus nerve, the three vagal states and how it all works. And it's all around that vagus nerve sensing danger or safety and then deciding where to go. Let me bring in complex trauma because uh, that's what we do. We want to understand how does complex trauma affect whatever we're talking about. So, as you probably have already figured out, a person in complex trauma is in their neuroception or their perception is constantly sensing danger. So they are constantly in either their sympathetic state or their dorsal vagal state. They're rarely in their social engagement system, in their ventral vagal state. So they're rarely in a state of health. They're always in fight or flight, or if that's not working, in freeze the dorsal state. Paul, the parasympathetic has taken over and is shutting you down. The next piece to understand that is so important is if you're rarely in the social engagement state, but always in one of the survival states, the reptilian states, that becomes your normal. That's where your nervous system gets used to going and living. And so what can then easily happen is you get stuck in either the sympathetic state or the dorsal state. And so the slightest little thing can activate that state. If you ever did go to the social engagement state, the slightest thing can take you to those other states because that's where you're used to being. That feels the most normal to you. But complex trauma does this another thing, and this is where there's kind of, they say, a flaw in the system. If you can think of a person who grows up in danger, so their neuroception is always sensing something's not safe here, so they're constantly going to either their sympathetic or their dorsal state, they get to a point where their brain says, we're always in danger, so every situation we go into now, let's just assume danger. I, I, it takes too much time to tell the difference between real or imagined danger, so let's just imagine danger. It's just a safer assumption. And so now, every situation you go into, basically you go into and you activate either the sympathetic or dorsal state, and it keeps the person there. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy loop for the person to always stay in the survival states. 
The next thing to understand from that is that if you're always in the two survival states, the sympathetic or the dorsal states, and not in the social engagement state, you're rarely, if ever, in the state where healing takes place in the body. And so you will begin to have health problems. Your immune system will not work properly. And so your heart's going too much, your blood pressure's up, your digestion's affected neg negatively. And so those can all begin to have health problems for a person. And so again, when you get this whole three states out of balance and they're not working the way they're designed to work, as far as health, you're gonna have health problems. Another thing to understand is when a person goes to the dorsal state, so the fight or flight's not working, but they have to go to that freeze, one of the things that the body does is it releases inflammation. And that's going to protect the body from harmful invaders. But now you've got things swelling up. And so it's interesting that many people today who come out of complex trauma have inflammation type disorders. And it's because of that whole system that's been working inside of them because of complex trauma. The next piece is it messes up mental health. So when a person is in their sympathetic state all the time, that leads to anxiety issues. When they're in their dorsal state all the time, that leads to depression issues. And if they're kind of back and forth between those two systems, depression and anxiety become a part of their life. And so it messes up your health, causes this inflammation stuff, and then it affects your mental health. I wanna add a piece here that I think is really important to understand. A lot of people that I work with, when they come into recovery, they start hearing all the time that you need to develop healthy self-care. You need to learn to get into your parasympathetic, into your social engagement system, and rest and restore your body, and take care of yourself, and meet your 12 needs. All of those things become very important. What I have found is for many people where their brain goes when they hear self-care is, something that actually looks like going into their dorsal state, into freeze mode, into veg mode, into sitting on the couch all day and doing nothing, into just pampering themselves with self kind of indulgent, empty activity stuff. So here's the key piece to understand. The social engagement state where true health and healing and restoration takes place is, has to have connection. Connection to self, connection to somebody else who's safe. That is always gotta be an element of self-care. And so a lot of people coming out of complex trauma, when they think of self-care, they just wanna do it all by themselves and just kind of go to zombie. What they have to realize is no true self-care includes a lot of that kind of zombie activity, but it also has to include connection. And so for many people, <clears throat> their definition of self-care ends up not being good self-care. It ends up just being going back to their dorsal state. Let me take you to the next piece of this. A lot of interest in the polyvagal theory today is around trauma. And can we use polyvagal theory to help people heal from trauma? And what we're finding out is yes. And, and it's really on a couple levels. So the first level is polyvagal theory shows us so much that I need to be in the social engagement system to be healthy. And that means I need a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems between work and rest, between self-care and productivity. All of that is so important and has been reinforced by polyvagal theory. But then there's the second thing and it's got two parts to it. So the first is when you're 
three states because of your vagus nerve constantly being stimulated of danger. Your three states have been out of whack. You've always been in the sympathetic or dorsal states. You have to retrain your whole vagus nerve and polyvagal system to be healthy because your normal is not a healthy vagal system normal. And so we're going to talk about how to do that. The next one, remember we talked about that horse that gets spooked and then it it goes crazy. So it's what's gonna happen in recovery is you're still gonna get triggered by danger and you're gonna go to your sympathetic or dorsal and you're gonna dysregulate. And so the question becomes, how do you get regulated again and get back to your social engagement system? The vagus nerve can play a role in that. And that is an important thing to learn is kind of how do I put the reins on that and return to that healthy state? And the more quickly I can do it, the better. And so that's what all of this is helping people with trauma find ways of healing. So let me get, get into ways to retrain our vagus nerve. Bottom line is there's no quick fix here. A lot of people are hearing this and going, oh, maybe there's a magic quick fix where I can just do this and my vagus nerve will get fixed overnight. No, this is a retraining process. So here are the components of what your vagus nerve needs to be able to reside in your social engagement system in that healthy state. Number one, you need safe people and trust. You have to be able to trust and you have to have safe people that you can trust. Absolutely essential. Now that is so difficult for people from complex trauma. That's going to be something you have to gradually relearn how to do because you've had all your trust violated. Secondly, you have to connect regularly. And I would say pretty much daily with safe people at a deep level, not just superficial connection, though some of that is good and important, but some real heart to heart, deep connection. That is such an important part in your vagus nerve, or we call it vagal, vagal tone, becoming healthier. So you think of muscle tone, you want healthy muscle tone. We're working toward healthy vagal tone. So the next piece to that is you have to be able to set boundaries with unhealthy people who are going to keep triggering the vagus nerve to go to sympathetic or dorsal systems. So boundaries and enforcing boundaries to make sure I'm safe becomes a necessary skill. Then I need to find a calm center in myself. I need to be able to ground myself and get grounded internally so that there's a calmness internally. Doesn't matter what's going on in my external world, I can get to a calm place internally. And so that's learning to meet my 12 needs. That's learning to be present to myself. That's learning to connect with myself. That's learning to regulate my emotions. All of those tools become necessary in retraining the vagus nerve. Then I need mindfulness where I, on a regular basis, daily connect to myself during the day to see how am I doing. And then self-compassion. Such an important piece in retraining the whole vagal system. I can't have that strong inner critic constantly putting myself down, berating myself, beating myself up for every little failure. I need self-compassion. And so another way to say that is the vagus nerve picks up whether other people are safe, but it also picks up, am I safe with myself? Do I have compassion towards myself? What another thing they have found is when you're complex trauma messes up the whole vagal system, what you begin 
noticing and obsessing about and focusing on is negative. And so what they're finding is gratitude has a wonderful way of helping to retrain your vagal system back to a healthy state. So learning gratitude. The next one is what is called attention control. So if you can imagine somebody who's in constant danger, it affects your attention in two ways. Number one, you obsess about danger and that gets all your attention. That's all you can think about. Or you have ADHD, you can't focus on anything. You're just bouncing constantly from one thing to another, trying to make sure you're still safe. And so what they have found is we have to retrain people to give more and more attention for longer and longer periods of time to the right things. So they're not obsessing on negative and they're not bouncing all over. But because they've been doing that for so long, we have to retrain the whole attention system. And so that becomes such an important thing. So what happens, the attention system works on three basic networks. So alertness and then orientation. So I get information about what's going on and then executive control, I make a decision about what to do. And so if you think of when you perceive a threat, a threat, you're on alert. There's danger, there's danger. You quickly gather information about society, about what's going on around you, and then you make a decision, okay? What hinders your ability to stay focused on the right stuff today? Well, think about it. If you have unresolved conflict, unresolved stress in your life, unresolved pain, it gets really hard to concentrate because your mind keeps going to those unresolved things and we keep thinking about it, okay? What else? If you get your trauma triggered or your shame triggered, so something happens and all of a sudden your trauma is triggered, memories come back, flashbacks, or your shame is triggered, you just feel terrible about yourself, you can't concentrate for the rest of the day because your mind keeps going back to those things. So another way to say it is whenever our limbic brain gets triggered intensely with painful stuff, it is really hard to maintain attention. And so part of what we have to do with people who come out of complex trauma in retraining their vagal nerve is increase their attention span little by little. Helping them not to feed obsessive thoughts about what's not healthy or helpful and how to build growing attention focus time. You think of a, a child often when they go through something and they, they process it, they talk about it for about a minute and that's it. They go on to something else. And so you, you gradually get them to talk longer and longer about it. And so that is what is happening in this intention control. The next thing, and we're going to touch on it just in, in a bit, um, but I'm going to do another talk on it later. And that is what they're finding is somatic therapy, somatic awareness. And that's so your, what's going on in your body is very helpful in helping your vagus system get restored and retrained. So there's two ways to come at retraining, and just to kind of say it in different words. Number one is what we call top-down approaches. And so that is the brain works bottom up. So it, when you process any information, it goes through your brain stem, then it goes into your limbic brain, and then finally to your cortex, the top of your brain. And so top-down approaches are you teach your cortex facts, awareness, information, you teach them new tools that were gonna help them handle situations, what healthy looks like. And so all of those tools and all of that learning, that's called top-down approaches. And those are extremely useful. That's what we do much of in our LIFT program, but there's dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, now, CPT, which is cognitive processing therapy, schema therapy, psychoanalysis, psychodynamic therapy, top-down approaches. 
All of those are so important in helping your vagus system get retrained and to get healthy. But what most people realize is if they get triggered very intensely, a lot of those things don't work because your brain goes to your brain stem and your limbic brain. It doesn't get to the cortex. And so you're acting out of your brain stem and your limbic brain, not out of your cortex. So it's like you forgot everything you learned. And so that's why you need bottom up approaches. And this is such an important part in learning to retrain and help your vagus system. So bottom up approaches are things that you do with your body that help your brain stem and limbic brain calm down. So you can think of soothing a baby. So a baby is upset, it's crying, it is panicking. It is in its brain stem, it is limbic brain. What helps that baby to calm down? Well, you don't use a top-down approach, you use a bottom-up. So mom rocks it, soothes it. But here's what I want you to see. Remember that what brings in that social engagement system, that healthy system, connection. So the baby looks in mom's eyes. The baby feels mom's skin, mom rubbing the back, mom patting it. There is a connection to mom and that helps calm the baby down. Basically that soothes the brain stem and the limbic brain. But connection is a key piece of that. But then there's extra physical things that help with that. And so those are the bottom up somatic things. So here are some, and there's quite a few that they're finding are very, very helpful in retraining your vagal systems. So deep, slow breathing. That activates all the right systems and the vagus nerve responds to that. Yoga, Dr. Stephen Porges has just done an article on the research now that's showing how yoga helps the whole vagus system. Meditation, and part of meditation for some people is visualization. So they're able to visualize going to a safe spot, maybe a spot that was a safe place in childhood or going to a safe person and getting a hug. Whatever, visualizing safety, visualizing calmness, sitting by the ocean, sitting on, on a mountain peak, looking out at, a, at the sun going down. All of those things become very, very important. They're also finding that Regular walking, regular exercise are very good in retraining the vagus system. Martial arts, also excellent in, in helping the vagus system. And then there's EMDR, so eye movement desensitization, reprocessing where you move your eyes back and forth as you think about different things, but only do this with a, a professional, a therapist, that helps in pro reprocessing the trauma and that helps the vagus system. Brain spotting is part of that, but it's kind of where you look at one spot, which once you find that spot, it somehow activates certain things, memories, and then you can reprocess them. The next bottom up approach is a whole bunch of different Therapy, so art therapy, drama therapy, dance therapy, pet therapy, equine therapy, all of those they're finding have a wonderful effect on the vagus nerve. Music therapy, they're finding that when you hum or chant or sing or even gargle, that has a positive effect on your vagus nerve. Laughter, deep belly laughter, has a wonderful effect on the polyvagal system. Another one that's interesting is cold water. So it's cold ice packs or an ice bath 
or putting your face into ice cold water and that triggers the dive reflex and that calms the whole vagus system down. So that's another one. A long hug from somebody who's very safe, who's not using you, where there's no sexual connotations, that long hug helps the vagal nerve, the vagus nerve. True intimacy sex. So this is not just kind of that physical animal type sex where you just, it's a physical thing. This is where you truly connect. And out of that deep, safe connection, the sexual experience, there's a positive effect on the vagus nerve. Connecting with nature, another very positive. Just sitting very quietly, positive. Massage therapy and reflexology. They're finding, again, stimulate the vagus nerve in very positive ways. And then to take that further, they're also finding what they call vagus nerve massage. So Sam Zan, the psychiatrist, says a gentle massage is a method of vagus nerve stimulation. Massage behind the ear, since a branch of the vagus nerve actually travels near that area. So additionally, gently tugging down on the ear also stimulates the vagus nerve. Also doing vagus nerve massage on the side of the neck where you can feel the pulse of your carotid artery. This can improve your vagal tone and instantly calm down an increased heart rate and panicky feelings. And then there's what they call vagus nerve tapping. So Giuliani Villani suggests gently drumming your thymus point or the midpoint of your chest, which is known as the happiness point. You can tap here with your pointer and index fingers for about 20 seconds or longer if it feels good while focusing on your breath. Notice what happens. For me, I get more energized and focused. And then another thing that's helpful, progressive muscle relaxation. So this involves tensing and then releasing each muscle group or area of the body for a few seconds. Then you move to the next muscle group, tense and release that. And so start at one end of the body and go to the other end. So start with your face and then go down to your feet. This allows us to combine somatic mindfulness, relaxation breathing, and muscle tension relief to enhance the parasympathetic nervous drive. And then the other thing they're finding in kind of revitalizing and retraining the vagal systems are healthy eating, including probiotics because part of the vagus nerve is sensing your gut and Omega-3 oils are, they find are helpful as well. And so this, as you can see, is still a growing field of research, but it is giving us just a clear picture of the complexity of us as humans, how complex trauma messes up that beautiful, beautiful system, how we have to retrain it, and the practical tools to help us begin to retrain it. And so again, I think what I would say to people is you need both a top down and a bottom up approach. Learn the bottom up stuff, it's wonderful. But you also have to get the top down. You gotta get the awareness, you gotta get the education, you gotta begin dealing with the shame, the different fears, understand how all that affects you. And then as you begin to do both of those, your vagus system begins to heal and get retrained. So I hope that's helpful for you. It's such an important concept, such an important thing just to be aware of. Well, that's the end of our Friday night. Again, 